Okay, so uh, you were born July 29th, 1951 uh, in London, I think, and that makes you a Leo. I know you're not a believer in astrology, but do you identify with any Leo traits? To tell you the honest truth, I did once upon a time read about that sort of thing, and I think there were some characteristics that I had, but it, I don't even have, a, I couldn't tell you. And I have done some research on astrology, which has just confirmed some of my, my greatest fears, which is that people bend themselves towards what they think they're supposed to be according to astrology. And we know from hundreds of experiments that astrology cannot predict, you know, which partners you'll get on with or what your life will be like or anything else. And even worse, I think they can mold their children. You know, oh, he's going to be a little Leo. That means he'll be, and then you know, it, it's it's not, yeah, n enough. No, I don't. Sorry. <laughs> I know. I know. No. I know. Um, you can decide. <laughs> and it's it's true that um, if you tell teachers, oh, this group of children is brilliant, and this one is just average, then the ones the teacher thinks is brilliant will perform better. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's exactly that. That's what I'm worried about, the same effect. Yeah, yes. got it. Um, do you know your Myers-Briggs type? No, your person? I haven't a clue. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I'm supposed to be. I am a psychologist, but I'm not that sort of psychologist. I haven't a clue. Sorry. I, I sent you the link, and I hope you'll take it, because um, it, it pe people are having very distinct outcomes in terms of the, the four types in the Myers-Briggs and it's it's an interesting profile and it's just what I would predict. I probably have done it in the past. You must think I'm a bit airhead but that sort of thing doesn't really interest me so it goes straight out of my head when I'm trying to remember all the details of publications on this and that. That's not the sort of thing that sticks. If you tell me what the four profiles are I might vaguely have some clue but the only thing I do know is that in the classic um, uh, extroversion, introversion tests, um, I'm just weird because people always uh, just assume from my behavior that I'm extrovert. That's just what I seem to be to people. And yet I come out on the questionnaires as pretty much introvert. You know, questions like, you know, in the evening, would you rather go to a party and have fun or sit at your desk working? Well, obviously I'd sit at my desk working. Why would I want to go to a party? Waste of time. You know, I want to get on with my life, you know. Um, so I don't know. I, you're quite right. I, I, I didn't notice you'd sent me the link. I will try and find out. Okay. Um, but the, the fours are categories, extrovert, introvert, sensing, intuitive, thinking, feeling, likes open options, likes structure. Right. The open options, I would definite, definitely guess in, in advance of doing it that I would. The others, I will just have to find out. Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't answer your question. No, that's fine. We'll get to it. Uh, what about your birth order? I'm asking because one of the people I interviewed told me about a rebel scientist study where they found that uh, people who were not conformists tended to be later borns. But I haven't found that in this study. What about you? Very interesting. I read that research too. Um, no, I'm a first firstborn. I have a sister two and a half years younger and a brother 11 years younger. So, no, I don't fit that. Sorry. No, well, none of it. I have many more firstborns than laterborns in this study. But maybe because statistically there are more firstborns there than are. later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. What, what about your childhood led you to Oxford? And, and, and girls probably weren't in a, a, a large segment of the student population when you went. No, it was one to eight. It was fantastic. Um, you know, eight, eight, eight men to one woman. Yeah. The bad, the downside was uh, one. There were only three women's colleges, and they were all women, uh, and loads and loads of men's colleges. It was the year after I left that they changed that. Um, it was pretty strict. I was the last person in Oxford to be rusticated. That means sent away from Oxford, sent to the country, rusticated. Um, uh, for the rest of term for being found with a man in my room and when my daughter went to Oxford they were told they could only have two men in their room at a time <laughs> so you know it's changed that much but your question about how I got there what was it about my childhood very very hard to say um, my father was a well-to-do businessman my mother was a wife my dad didn't expect his wife to work so she was a, a housewife um, I was sent to a really, really vile, awful boarding school, which I've recently been back to, which was 
another story, but very emotional and quite transformative, actually, to face up to it. Really horrible. Um, but I discovered there that I was bright and kind of my way with coping, my way of coping, <laughs> well, that tells you a lot about me, my way of coping with life and thinking all the other girls hated me, which they probably didn't, but you know how it is as a kid. My only way of coping was just to work harder and become top in physics and coming top in physics and chemistry and things like that at a girls boarding school in the 1960s does not make you popular. Nevertheless, it was the only thing that kind of I could put my energies into. Um, so I did well and I got my A-levels. And um, then I wanted to be a doctor and my mum wanted me to be a doctor and all of that. And I had this kind of realisation in the middle of the night in my dormitory bed in, in, in school that I, I would be terrible to be a doctor. It's not, not for me, uh, you know, to be in the hospitals with ill people all the time. And I'd probably marry another doctor in my whole life. And I'm just like, nah. um, and, um, and so I was in terrible trouble with my parents and the school and everything else. But I then had to change A-level subjects, and which I did. Um, and, um, and my biology teacher said, it's fascinating now, this would have been 1968 or nine. She said, you love biology, I know, but don't go do biology at university because biology is basically all sewn up now. <sighs> Can you imagine? You know, in, in the 50s, the structure of DNA was discovered. She could not have seen what's happened. And she said, why don't you do psychology? Which was great. And, and I loved it. And so that's really, I stayed on an extra term, did the Oxbridge exams, which you had to do in those days. And and then I got to Oxford, which was just wonderful. It was the escape from this horrendous school and everything else, you know. Um, uh, and and I loved it there. And what, I loved the work as well. What, was and that's where I had these strange experiences and joined the Psychic Research Society and all those kind of stuff that followed from there. Was the boarding school horrendous, not academically, but the, the interaction with the other girls was what makes it terrible? No, I expect it's hard for you to imagine an awful lot of people of my age that I know here, my husband included, have been harmed by their boarding schools. Sleeping in a room with four or five other girls with very strict rules, you had the bell went at 10 to 7, you had to get up, you had to clean your bits and put your mat in this way, you had a dressing table where you were only allowed to have five pieces of things, one of which had to be a picture of your parents. Um, you had to be out by 25 past running around the outside of the school buildings. You had to be sitting at your breakfast place at 7.30. You had to be in class all day, two hours of sports every afternoon, lessons until seven in the evening, supper, one hour of free time, bed, lights out, not allowed to take any books to your bedroom. You had to be lying down with your eyes shut and the lights off from, depending on your age, whatever time, till 10 to seven. No privacy, no fun, weekends with absolutely nothing to do. Um, constant fear in my part that I, you know, the bell rang and I've forgotten what I'm supposed to be doing. Where am I supposed to be? I'll get it wrong. I'll be in trouble, constantly in trouble. Just to give you a simple example, um, uh, one one day I went through a door that you're not allowed to go through if you're not uh, a certain age or and if you've been naughty, which I was always being naughty. And so on Thursday, which was the night when there was pop at the top of the pops with things like the Beatles on, you know, uh, in black and white in the evening. Um, they always chose punishment that on the Thursday evening. And there were chips for supper, the only time we ever got them on a Thursday evening. Um, so they chose punishments then, and I had to sit in a classroom with my old, you know, ink pen and write a hundred times, I must learn not to walk through doors with... No, I must learn... Um, I must learn not to... Uh, how awful, I can't remember it. Well, I can see why. It was traumatic. <laughs> I must learn not to take advantage of those privileges, such as walking through centre, which I have not yet earned myself. hundred times. hundred times. So barbaric. Now, does that give you a kind of yes. idea of what it was like for six, seven years? It sounds like prison. Oh, oh, absolutely. Oh, God, if you went out of the actual gate, which was never, there wasn't a gate. It was quite, quite a portico thing, you know. If you went out of there, I don't know what would happen. You'd be expelled, I should think. Yeah, yeah, it was like a prison. Yeah. Um, sorry, I should, you asked me about No, that. no, I, I'm, I was curious. Always. And I'm thinking that uh, young Indian women in universities still have those kind of uh, restrictive medieval rules in, in their dormitories. So it, it's, it's, it's a current issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, I sympathize. Yeah. 
Uh, when you were in your first year at Oxford, you were smoking hash, doing the Ouija board, sleep deprived, and you had this out of body experience that really triggered your interest in in paranormal parapsychology. Um, and and at the t then later you you realized that that was caused by sleep deprivation, smoking hash, and the Swiss neurosurgeon Olaf Blanke said that it has to do with right temp temporal parietal junction that that alters the brain. <laughs> so what what did you conclude over time that caused that kind of mystical astral travel out of body experience? When you say later, I realized that. We are talking 40, 45 years later. I mean, that discovery of the temporoparietal junction was in 2002. And that set off a slew of research on out of body experiences, that, which is fantastic. You know, all my life since, the, since I had that experience, it's been a fringe, you know, even fringe as far as parapsychology is concerned. And now there are serious scientists working on it. So for most of that time, until pretty recently, which is why I wrote my new book, Seeing Myself, The New Science of Outer Body Experiences, that was because of all this new research. All those decades in between, I was floundering. And I mean, I had the experience in 1970. I wrote a book in 1982 doing my, the best I could to try to understand, you know, could it be natural? Could it be a brain-based thing? Or does it really mean something's left the body? And because of little things in my own experience, like when I was flying over the roofs of Oxford, when I looked the next day, they were wrong. Um, those things didn't bother me at the time. I just thought, oh, well, the astral world is is a bit different from the physical world. You know, it's not identical or um, my astral astral eyes are not good enough or, you know, whatever. And some of the weird things about it, like I went descending down to, a, to an island with 100 trees and I thought afterwards, well, you wouldn't count the trees. It was more like a kind of mental image of that. And then I thought, well, the astral world is full of thought forms. And I read Ledbetter and all the people who do stuff on thought forms. And but there was always this ambiguity and ambivalence. And I wrote this book that really, as well as I could, talked about how relaxation and um, cutting off input from the senses um, and going into your own mind could conceivably lead you to adopt a bird's eye view, which is quite common in dreams. And I did studies that show that people who dream in bird's eye view more often have out-of-body experiences. And there was all this going on. But it honestly wasn't until fairly recently that I, I'm just, I don't see any, any, any point now in speculating that out-of-body experiences are anything other than what we know they are. They are a disruption of the body schema, that sort of map we have of our own body, which is um, constructed and maintained all the time in the temporoparietal junction and connects with our memories and everything else. It all falls into place. Um, and so we don't need, you, you, can, you can believe in astral bodies if you want, but you know, there's no need any longer um, because we know what, what's going on in the brain at the time. Could you explain that a little bit more so that you're, you're flying to New York during that experience um, and all, all the sensations that you had of looking down at your body, it's caused by a, like an improper functioning of that part of the brain or what, what exactly leads to those kind of visions? Is it similar to what happens in dreams? It's, it's similar, but it's, it's not very similar to ordinary dreams, but it is very similar to lucid dreams. And I think anyone who's had lucid dreams, which is something like 40% of the population, um, <clears throat> will know that feeling when you become lucid, i.e. you realize it's a dream. Then you can see so much clearly, everything becomes bright and vivid. And very often you can then control it and say, oh, I'm going over there or I'm going to turn that monster into a cuddly pussycat or whatever you, you feel like doing. It, it's very, very much similar to that. And knowing that that's what lucid dreams are like, you know that your brain is very much capable of producing wonderful, vivid, rich, including emotions and sounds, um, uh, imagery. So why should this happen when you're awake? We know that people are awake when they have out-of-body experiences. Some are on the verges of sleep in a kind of um, maybe stage one sleep, but more um, just on the edges. But many, many people are wide awake as I was. I was sitting up and talking. Um, now, what's happening there, I mentioned the body schema 
I always point at this bit of my head. The body schema, every animal that moves needs a body schema. It's the brain is constantly knowing the head's here, the arms are here, the hands are here. I don't, I probably drunk tea while I've been talking to you without really noticing that I was because the, you know, the body schema is used to make sure the arm gets there and gets the cup of tea and so on. All this is happening all the time. Now, why, and it has to be kept in touch all the time with what you're seeing and what you're feeling and what you're, you know, how, everything like that. All, all otherwise the, you might fall down or yeah, exactly, collapse. Exactly. Exactly. So the body schema interacts constantly with sensory input. And then you, so you feel as if you're in your body. You know, that's how I feel now. I expect you do too. Here I am. That's an illusion as well. That's another story. But he, here I am sitting here and, and knowing where my hands are. Why would that go wrong? One thing is cutting off the sensory input, but other things can do it, um, such as a lack of oxygen in the brain and so on. But one of the things I've discovered from the recent research is that um, people who have very hyperactive um, cortex are much more likely to have out-of-body experiences. I'll call them OBEs. Um, and I discovered also that I really do. Um, I'm terribly sensitive to flashing patterns. Um, I'm very sensitive to noises. Like There are lots of noises that, you know, and this is due to hyperactivity in the, in the sensory cortex. And if you get hyperactivity in the temporoparietal junction, that disturbs the body schema. Mm. And that hyperactivity, people who are naturally like that are, are more likely to have OBEs. But imagine the situation where you're sleep deprived. Sleep deprivation causes this kind of random activity. Um, so can cannabis too? And this is why you're, you were saying that I, I finally concluded that these factors fed into it. Um, and so really anything, including electric, um, that's how we know about it, uh, stimulation with electrodes in the brain can cause that kind of random activity. Then what happens, poor old brain is trying to do its job. It's trying to keep the body schema, you know, connected to all the input and it can't. So what does it do? It doesn't lose the body schema. It just goes free floating. It's no longer connected to what I can see, what I can feel and so on. Um, and it's that disconnection. And the outer body experience then is a sort of brain's attempt to get back to normal, thinking as I did then, you know, where am I? What's really going on? Oh my goodness. As in many dreams, I'm looking down and seeing myself. You know, I was looking down and seeing the body down there. Well, it was my idea of the body, but it was the brain's attempt to make sense of it. And I was lucky enough to have a friend who was saying, oh, what can you see? Have you got a silver cord? Oh, can you go to the astral realm? Whatever, you know. And, and so I didn't get frightened and go, oh my God, that's my body, <laughs> which is a very common reaction in OBEs. Right. Instead, I went, oh, oh, well, I'll find out. And, you know, I, 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 that's why I think it was such a very long and weird, <laughs> weird experience. Because Kevin was kind of reassuring you and kind of yeah. grounding you. So how is this different from psychedelic drugs or, you know, LSD or ketamine or whatever it's called? Is oh, it totally, this? totally different. Have you had LSD? Mm -mm. Um, I've had it. It's not a drug that any sensible person takes very often. I mean, experts on it will take it, you know, once a year or something. And I'm rather like that. Um, but I have had enough experience with LSD. It's nothing like that at all. It transforms everything. I'm, typically, you do not have OBEs. You do not feel disconnected from your body. Mm. But you as a person feel utterly different in your relationship to the world. You can get into... Well, I suppose in, in LSD, you can have mystical experiences of the kind that mine eventually turned into, in which there's a loss of self, in which everything is one. And you just know, in a way that's impossible to articulate when you come back, that you are one with, with those trees over there. And, you know, that, that sort of thing. There's that similarity. But nothing like the sensation of being outside your body and everything being clear. You know, there's the hallucinations. Like if I, I'm looking at a field across the river now. Now, if I was um, tripping, the, the, the grass would be going and things would be slithering about it. You know, it's not like that at all. So it's a different mechanism. In terms of how yeah, it affects yes, the brain. It is. <clears throat> it's a totally different mechanism. Oh. It operates on the... Um, the, on, um, the, the inhibitory mechanisms in the brain and so on. But you mentioned ketamine. That's another story altogether. Ah. I've only had ketamine once in order to find out, uh, to, in my own interest, 
um, whether I would have another out-of-body experience. You can imagine how keen I was to do so. I was lucky enough to have a, in, injected a very high dose, just, it's an anesthetic, just sub-anesthetic. And I was lying on a waterbed with nice music and it was all very, very well organized. I've been lucky with my drug teachers and drug experiences. Um, and I've taken them seriously and not messed around stupidly with them. Um, anyway, there I am, everything's paralyzed except my eyes. It's really quite unpleasant, but interesting. And kind of seemed as if I was out of my body, you know, but, but everything was, it was bleary and weird and just not, nothing like the clarity and immediacy and feeling of being there in that OBE or indeed in, in some lucid dreams. I don't think there's any drug, there's no, there's no shortcut like that um, to having an OBE. Hmm. Sure. There we go. <laughs> it's interesting that um, Michael Pollan, who we know is interested in food, just wrote <clears throat> the book about the use of psychedelics and working with anxiety and depression and other mental health problems. So um, I loved his book um, on uh, on psychedelics. <laughs> Wonderful book. And I'm sorry. What, what was your question? My my question is: I'm trying to understand the different mechanisms between like sleep, sleep deprivation or <clears throat> a, a drug or a near-death experience it, it but what I'm understanding is they affect the brain in different ways it's not like a uniform mechanism for how these experiences happen yeah and there are similarities and differences between all of these things what I would love to see and I've written occasionally mentioned this is and people have tried to produce a map of altered states. Um, you know, which ones are closer to others? Which ones are more similar? Which ones can you get from one to another, even if it's not so similar? And which can you not get to them? And people have tried. It's something, I don't know, I'm quite old now. and I don't know how much uh, longer I'll be alive. But I, it's one of the things I would like to see um, at some time would be a really effective map where you would show how you get from an ordinary dream to a lucid dream and back and is it easier to get from there to sleep paralysis and you know all those sorts of things we don't have such maps we have little clues and little bits and pieces here and there but yes lots of different brain mechanisms involved some leading to bleary you know i'm not really myself kind of others leading to out of body i'm absolutely myself others leading to i'm in this world but it's different others leading to i'm in a completely different world and also mystical insights i mean straightforward dropping self oneness these sorts of things which are not common exactly but have been reported through all ages by mystics happened. yeah the yeah. mystical and, and long-term meditators yeah um some people think that that the brain <clears throat> the brain sets up these filters that keep us kind of in a rational mode and that when <clears throat> those filters are disrupted by deprivation or drugs or whatever then it removes the filters that keep us ordinarily from accessing these mystical feelings of oneness or whatever what do you think of the filter theory uh well in its classic form from bergson it doesn't really work but as a vague idea i think that there's something in it but i mean they're not filters like in your car or something, you know? I mean, they are the, the way we use language and the education that we have and the thinking that we do in, in our culture and the other ideas that we have. And I suppose you could say that the, the sense of self is a construction of the brain. You know, I think this is what is meant by Anatta in Buddhism, in, in no self, in um, the neuroscientific ideas of there's no one inside the brain. That is a, a um, it, it, it's an illusion that helps us get around in the world, connected very much to the body schema, of course. So I live a normal life in an educated society, thinking of myself as something inside here in control of the body. Now that fundamental basic thought, which is which is propped up again all the time by by our social life and everything else, in a sense is is one of those filters. Because if you spend, if all your thinking and feeling time is about me, 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 and I'm here and the world's out there, 
you become dualist. I think little kids become dualist very, very early. There's lots of lovely research on how children talk about their body and my brain, you know, those kind of things. My brain helps me, you know, there's a me and there's a brain, and you know. Um, and um, so that makes sense because it's useful in, in, in our lives, but it, it leads to this duality of mind and matter. It leads to the hard problem of consciousness. How can a physical brain be responsible for, I use my words carefully here, um, this experience? This is a massive, massive problem for consciousness studies and also for, for, for physics in, in some ways. Um, so it's the sense of self that leads to that. Now, dropping the sense of self, letting go of that duality is easy said, but you can't, you know, okay, just drop it now. Well, maybe you can. <laughs> I, I can't. No. I can do it. Uh, this thing can do it in on retreat, for example, or if if I, if I do a lot of meditation, um, then it goes away. I've had enough mystical experiences in my life to know how it feels when it's gone away. But even then, I can't really make sense of it and say anything very coherent about it. As they say, these experiences are ineffable. You can't really describe it. Um, nevertheless, as it encourages me to think that um, ultimately we will have some non-dual understanding of the universe, which we don't have at the moment. Um, and going back to your filter question, uh, I think it's the sense of self and the natural um, uh, dualism, belief in dualism we have that is the main um, obstacle, rather than some sort of little things in the brain that are stopping us, and, you know, for some reason, I don't know. <laughs> so a, a non-dual understanding would be simply materialist, that, it, that everything is, no, is physically no. based. No, 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 absolutely not. Um, in, a, in a simple way, think this. You've either got, the world is either consisting, like Descartes and many others have thought, of two kinds of stuff. You know, there's mind and there's matter and they're separate. That's dualism. Monism says they're the same. But what same? Now, the most popular view in current science is, is as you've said, it's is materialism. But it's not, the, it's not the only view. There's idealism. I mean, there are many, many others. I Personally, people accuse me of being a materialist. I'm not a materialist. I don't know what matter is. You know, um, here's a cup, you know. Is it really atoms and molecules? Physics does a fantastic job of, of, of understanding and predicting, but then it gets down at the deepest level to big troubles. Um, but there are many, many reasons why I, I think materialism is not the whole answer. Um, but materialism is very interesting because it's so good at making predictions. And, um, you know, that's how we get all our technology. Without yeah. materialism, we, we wouldn't have got it. But on the other hand, if you go to idealism of any kind, and there are lots of kinds, um, and you say, you know, consciousness first or extended mind, it's all mind, then you can't account for that cup. You certainly can't account for how I can sit here and say, this is a cup. It was a cup of tea. The tea's gone. And you can see it. And anyone else watching will say, yeah, that looks pretty convincingly like a cup. <laughs> if, if it's all mind, how, how does the physical world appear in the way it does and appear logical and that you can do experiments on it? You can't explain that. So I would say both of those are in deep trouble, very different kinds of deep trouble. And I kind of hang around thinking, well, somehow... It's got to be all one, but I don't know how, and I don't think anybody else has yet got the answer either, which makes it a fascinating time to be studying these phenomena. Uh, as someone who practiced Zen, what, what would a Zen Buddhist monk say about idealism, materialism? They, they ah, would say well, it's all illusion, right? It's, so it's all mind. Well, that's not the same thing. But first of all, I would say, I don't know what a Buddhist monk would say. Uh, I practice Zen, yes. And I'm very careful with those words. I am not a Buddhist. I'm absolutely not going to sign up to the sort of things that you really need to sign up to if you are going to take the refuges and, and um, you know, be, become a Buddhist. What I love about Zen is basically it's taking the harshest instructions of the Buddha and saying sit down, stare at a blank wall and watch your own mind and work it out for yourself. And that's a long job. And I've had some fantastic Zen masters help along the way, but I am definitely not the kind of Buddhist scholar who could tell you what, what they, they say. And, you know, it interests me that 
I've been to loads and loads of retreats and been told all this stuff. Um, but what really interests me is the practice and what happens when you keep on practicing mindfulness and you sit every day, which I've done for 35 years maybe, um, and, and go on retreats and so on. Um, one of the things that interests me is, as in so many religions, Buddhism didn't start out as a religion, um, and it was hundreds of years after the Buddha gave all his famous discourses that they were written down. And then they become more and more, you know, by the time you get to the Abhidharma, there's all these seven these and ten this and twelve that and levels, and which don't, some correspond with things that we know now, and not an awful lot don't, and I just don't follow those things. And then in terms of more close to your question, would they say it's illusion, and would they say it, it's all mind, I guess from my limited experience of that, there are people who would say any of those things and more. Um, there's not just one view. What brings Zen practitioners together mostly, I think, is they like sitting, <laughs> like meditating and coming to learn about their own minds. And that, that's where I stand on it. Did, did Sorry, you, that's not a very helpful answer in oh, a way. Oh, no, it is. Did you um, work with koans and do that kind of thing, or did you mm. just try to keep mm. your mind still? Oh, yes, yes. Um, I've done a lot of different things. In fact, I wrote a book called Ten Zen Questions, which then, when it came out in paperback, they decided to call it Zen and the Art of Consciousness, which I had been too, I thought was too pretentious. Um, but anyway, that they persuaded me. Um, so that's what it's called now. And that is Ten Koans. Um, most of the chapters there are koans that I practiced on formal koan retreats. Uh, you know, you'd have a week and you'd work on a question like, when is this? That's a lovely koan, I mean, you know, or um, um, what am I doing? Uh, that, that's one I worked on on my own. I've done solitary retreats as well, sometimes up in the Welsh mountains, completely away from anything, um, no gas, electricity, and no phone, nothing, you know, water in a stream. Um, uh, I've done retreats in my own garden, sitting in the garden shed, you know, um, and asked worked with koans and I love working with koans but in it, it's not separate from uh, sitting with a still mind my, my normal everyday practice is open uh, zazen just just sitting I can hear the birds I can feel the cushion I can I'm lucky enough to live by a little river I can hear the river going by um, uh, what, whatever happens the cat jumps on them on, on the bed whatever it might be you know um, uh, when you want to do koan practice, you need that first. You need a still mind. Whether you do concentrative meditation, where you, which I've done also, but less, where you really concentrate hard on the breath or, or something like that. So you're narrowing your attention down. It's all about attention. Or you just open it up. Either way, you then just let the question, you know, and you don't even need to really say the words. Um, one of the koans I worked with, there is no time, what is memory? That's a fantastic one. <laughs> uh, I love that one because um, my Zen teacher then, who, who's, who's dead now, but um, he gave us that one and he'd read it over um, a, a temple gate somewhere. And um, my approach to that, as I think many people would be, is, oh, well, if I believe there is no time, okay, that means blah, 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 and then, what is memory? Oh, gosh, now, well, if I don't believe this, then, oh, then I would believe that. And what if I take, you know, a tree of possibilities of intellectualizing, and this fantastic teacher said, just don't worry about it, that's what Westerners do. I teach Chinese people, they don't do that, but Westerners do, it'll wear itself out, which, of course, it does, you know, you spend, if you're me, a couple of days going, well, it could be this, and, you know, and it's, but it's done, it, those thoughts are coming up within a still mind, and you can kind of see them. And after a while, it all kind of, the question takes on a very different um, feel and becomes an unspoken longing to understand something about time, memory. So it's all, it all comes back to who am I in the end. But, but I, love, I love the koan practice. So it's not separate. But I've done, I've, I've done training in Mahamudra and jhanas and other, other kinds of meditation as well. So is, is the implication that... Uh logic and mind are very limited and we need to get to something beyond logic? Uh, yes, not, not, I don't think quite exactly that. It's not that there is something. It, it's kind of, the logic is like the filters you were talking about. 
logic is fantastic. We can do wonderful things with logic and we need logic. And it's very interesting to use a logical approach to a question, but it's not the only approach. And meditation teaches you to take a different approach. And in order to do that, you need a lot of practice because that approach is incompatible with 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 running and, and this and that and then holding all these different ideas all that has to go in order to see the nature of mind underlying all that so it's not to say that you know that's better and logic's bad or anything the mind is capable minds are capable of all kinds of different things so one is logical thinking another is dreaming and fantasizing and another is being still with some sense of observing the stillness and then some interesting questions then come again, who am I, what, you know, becomes um, all of these things come up in that. I look at them more as, as two sides of, 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 of the capabilities of mind. You, you mentioned the, the deep mind or the underlying mind. How is that different from our like prefrontal cortex? Um, well, the prefrontal cortex is a physical lump of matter, so I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, I think of this as being our logic and judgment. So it seems that what you're saying is we want to get past that to something deeper or truer. Okay. I think our knowledge of the brain at the moment is only really beginning. I mean, when you say you think of it that way, okay, that is a reasonable way of thinking of it. But the, the prefrontal cortex... All the frontal lobes which have expanded very much in human evolution more than in, in other great apes does a lot of control mechanisms. But it has to because you can't have a clever brain as complex as ours without lots and lots of different bits. And they're not just one great thing here. Lots and lots of bits of the brain are keeping control on others. You know, while I'm picking up this cup, I mustn't also be doing you know something else that I'll drop it. You'd, at a simple level, at a more complex level, if I want to think through an argument, there's got to be another bit of the brain saying, don't think about that, don't think you're meant to be thinking about this. This is attention. Now, this is not something that's just here. Attention is a brain-wide mechanism, very much argued about in neuroscience, and absolutely the heart of meditation, and, and I think important underlying mystical experiences as well. So my thinking about it is... It, it, in a way, as much as yours is just taking some bits of what we know about brains. But my thinking about my own morning meditation every day is what it's doing is is training the brain to just do less, all of it. And in doing less, there is not a call for this bit's doing this and this has got to control it and this bit's got to control, you know, it, it settles down and there's much more integration. So the sound of the bird over there I don't go, oh, it's a blackbird. Oh, I wonder where it's really. Nothing like that. Just the sound is a sound and the feel is a feel. And that they're much, much more integrated. And that stillness is like that. So it seemed the way I think about it is that it's um, a much more integrated and much calmer mind that settles down in meditation. Whereas to do the kind of stuff I'm doing now, you know, um, all these bits have got to be cooperating, helping each other, suppressing each other, and so on and so on. But the neuroscience is not yet there to really give us good metaphors, if you like, of, of what's going on. It's getting there. Wonderful things are being discovered. Um, but I think we need to be a bit careful of, of these sort of metaphors of, built on, on, on the bits of neuroscience that we do know. Mm. Um, you've, you've said, you've described yourself as an atheist, but it, you sound more like an agnostic in terms of Oh, no, 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 I'm an absolute 100% atheist. I mean, all atheist means is that you live without believing in a God. You know, I, I'm as sure as I can possibly be. It depends what God, there are so many different gods. But, I mean, I was brought up a Christian. And so I know something about the Christian God, what it's supposed to be like. And the Christian God is supposed to have created us. Not just that, but to have created us in his own image. That is blatantly false. You know, we know how we got here. We know how we evolved, not in every single detail, but amazing detail, because you can now look at DNA evidence and see where our ancestors came out of Africa and when the Denisovans split from the Neanderthals. And we know these things. You can't have a creator God. So that makes me an absolute atheist on that. What about answering prayers? 
uh, no evidence doesn't make sense. Uh, why would there be a God sitting up there caring about, you know, whatever it is that I might pray for? I mean, no, I, please, I am really, really, really an atheist. But I would say I have a spiritual practice. I have mystical experiences. That's not incompatible with being a monist, thinking there's only one stuff in the world. There weren't gods out there and heavens and hells. It just isn't. Somehow we need to understand all this within the scope of it all being one stuff. Um, I don't know how to do it, but that's why I'm so vehement about saying, of course, I'm an atheist. I'm not I'm not wondering about is there a God or not. Agnostic means not knowing. I'm agnostic about loads of things, but not about the existence of God. Believing in God is just, you know, I'd, uh, hmm. But then there's like the transcendentalists and the theosophists who who don't see God as a human form, but as an intelligence or a, you know, a universal uh, love or that kind of thing. And some people yeah. are kind of using consciousness as a word for that that kind of um, idea of, of a universal love or oneness. Yes, I have a lot more sympathy with um, with those kinds of ideas, or at least some of them. I, you know, I studied theosophy in great detail when I was younger, and I went along to the Theosophical Society in in uh, Bristol, and I even gave lectures to the Theosophists, and I learned all about thought forms and the seven um, layers and all of this stuff. But I go into some of this in my Seeing Myself book. Um, you you can't settle any arguments. You know when somebody says, well, there are seven levels, and the and the, the this level is the causal level, and this level is the um, etheric level, and whatever, and the etheric is supposed to pass energy to the astral. Well, there's no experiments you can do to find out whether it's true. And if somebody else says, oh no, that's the sixth level, well, it's just their opinion. Um, it, it really doesn't get you anywhere at all. If you go to what's sometimes called Einstein's God, well, just the the basis of everything, or the entirety of love or something like that you're not making you're not making any um uh testable claims or, or problematic claims you know it, it's fine to say that it doesn't doesn't really mean anything it can kind of help you if you think in a way um well i believe in some um some love that's everywhere that might help you to be more loving but it's not making a claim like the love that's everywhere created me in its image or something like that. Or if you do make that, then, then I would go back to the, to the atheism. You, you've um, been doing some research on near death experiences. And I'm, I'm wondering how you explain um, like even Alexander's experiences, or they're very similar to someone like Robert Monroe, who wasn't near death, but found himself astral traveling and, develop technology so other people could do it. Um, what what do you think is going on there with the very concrete memories that Alexander had, even though he said his whole brain was pus? Yeah, well, he was wrong about that. And there have been plenty of um, skeptical investigations uh, looking at the doctor's evidence on the state he was in. And he has made claims there, which, as I understand it, have, have been refuted. His experience was kind of like mine you know wasn't there a, a girl with a butterfly wings and all this I mean this is the kind of thing brains bring up isn't it um, also lots and lots of the arguments about near-death experiences revolve around when did the experience happen and that is very difficult to pin down um, in many cases there are claims that the experience happened when the person was unconscious but actually you don't know that all you know is once they came around enough to be able to speak either 10 minutes afterwards, or much, much, much more common the next day or the next week or whatever, then they will describe these experiences. You know, I was out of my body and I saw these things happening. Um, but the claim that there have been people seeing veridical things at the time the brain was flatlined, there is not a single one, which in my opinion, and I have done a lot of research <clears throat> on it, but, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, obviously people disagree here, but, um, I don't think any of them stand up to that. What we need, if we're going to say that any of these experiences happened when the brain couldn't be doing its normal thing with the TPJ and the dream capacity and all of that, what we need is, is the timing. And that um, comes close with, with um, Parnia and Phoenix famous studies in the hospitals 
you know, putting um, things above the bed um, while you've got people in a cardiac unit uh, with um, apparatus measuring their state and so on. Um, and they, they didn't find um, anything. That's not to say it's not there, but that's what I would expect. Um, so I'm not at all convinced. Um, you mentioned Ab Evan Alexander. Um, who else did you mention? Oh, oh yes, um, Robert Munro. I've tried his um, techniques. None of them really work for me. I, I know people who've been to the Institute. Um, the evidence coming out of the Institute is that it that works for a few people, but not very many. Um, but, you know, it's not surprising if you do the right things to your brain, you can have an out-of-body experience. Um, to my mind, nothing leaves the body in an out-of-body experience. It's an out-of-body experience. By the way, it's important to remember that an OBE is defined as see, the, the experience of seeming to be outside your body. And that's important because with that definition, we can say, right, all these people who say they felt they were out of their body, they had an out-of-body experience. Now we can investigate, did something leave? Is there an astral body or not? So that helps the research enormously. And my, you know, 40 years or whatever, um, gosh, it's almost 50 years since I had the experience, um, is um, that nothing does. But at least with that working definition, you know, when I meet anyone who says, well, I don't know if it was really an out-of-body experience, I say, by definition, it was. Now let's hear about it. Let's, you know, find out. So what... He, 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 even Alexander was in a coma, he was on life support, but are you suggesting that in fact his brain really was functioning enough to, to retain memory and to, to remember what his visions were? What? Well, at, at some point, yes. You see, I mean, he will only have, have written them down and talked to other people about them after he was capable of speaking again. Sure. So, you know, the girl with the butterfly wings, when did she happen? Did she happen in the depth of the coma? <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> did, did that experience with her happen in the depths of the coma? Or did it happen as he was going into the coma? And, you know, becoming that your brain doing that, you know what it's like going to sleep. You have these weird things on the edge if you pay attention. And I enjoy watching the, the sleep process um, mindfully. Um, you know, you'll know these weird things, similar, different but similar. Um, it could have happened then. It could have happened in brief, um, you know, uh, activity coming back and going again. It could have come at the end afterwards. He wouldn't have a way of knowing and nor would anybody else. And that's what we don't know. So you're saying that people who have these kind of near-death experiences weren't dead? there was enough life that they could yeah, have absolutely. these kind of visions. Absolutely. We have no good... I know there'll be people out there going, oh, yes, we do, because you read some of these books and they're full of these stories, that, you know, Dentures Man and the shoe on the ledge. And But isn't it fascinating that in all the decades I've been interested in this, there are just a few of these very, very famous cases which seem on the surface to prove that somebody saw something that they couldn't have known about when they were, um, their brain was completely not active. There are just a few of these and all of them have really, really serious problems when you actually get into detail in them. I, I wrote about that in, in, in this book uh, and elsewhere because I get fascinated by it. The typical out-of-body experience and the typical near-death experience, people see all kinds of things, either that can't possibly be checked because they're, they're dreamlike, they're much more vivid than a dream, they're much more realistic, they're much more intimate than a dream, but than an ordinary dream, but, you know, they're like my flying over the sea and going to an island with a hundred trees, they, you know, they're that kind of thing, um, or they're simply wrong. And it's very interesting to look at accounts of NDEs and think, well, that was wrong. And people often describe things like, well, it looked like my house, but it had a green door or, you know, whatever. They don't see things as being um, exactly correct. And the weight that's put on these very, very, very few close, you know, approximations to evidence, which then crumble. Oh, I think in the end, you know, I suppose what upsets me about this is 
people so want it to be true that I, me, this important me, 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 I am going to survive after death. This will make my life worth living. This will make it all all right. Things will be put right in heaven. What any number of reasons that people so want to survive that they'll just distort the evidence and write books endlessly and call it spiritual. You know, you're a more spiritual person if you believe in mind beyond and astral bodies. Why? What, what is spirituality? Let's ask that question. It's not really logical at all to think that telepathy might kind of make you more spiritual. Why, why would it? I mean, I can see how people get to that feeling. But in the end, it comes back to the desire to be important, to be something that's continuous. If we mention Buddhism again, the very thing that the Buddha saw was untrue, um, said he saw was untrue, if you disagree with him, um, if anyone disagrees with him, um, that self is like everything else. It's impermanent. Permanent. It's all about <laughs> change. Think, uh, what? It's all about change. Yeah, yeah. Everything comes and goes. And the self is... The, the idea of anatta, as I understand it, is not that there isn't anything that we can call a self. It's that the self is temporary, coming and going, arising and falling away, arising and falling away. It's not the same me now talking to you as it was when I started my cup of tea. Or when the cat, you didn't see the cat, she, no. she did, um, went round my legs and I, I, I thought I'd better pick her up and put too. It Mine's there. right here. <laughs> oh, good. <clears throat> but some um, Buddhists do, do believe that in reincarnation, which implies that, that there's a permanent soul. Yeah, yeah, they do. And, you know, I think, how can you? If you if you sit and meditate and, and, and come to see a, even a little bit of, um, uh, of what the Buddha was talking about, enough to encourage you to keep going. I mean, that's what encourages me to keep going, these sort of glimpses that deepen over the decades. Um, then... It just doesn't make any sense. But again, people want me, 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 me to go on, you know, wherever it is. And also, they want good people to be, um, to be um, rewarded. Uh, thank you, rewarded, and bad people to be punished. So the idea of reincarnation is is very tempting from that point of view. And it comes down as all the memes of all religions come down to more than monotheistic ones, but in Buddhism too, it allows the men to control the women. It allows powerful men to control everybody it, because it gives them the, oh no, the priests and everything and we'll teach you and we'll make sure that if you behave this way, you'll have a wonderful reincarnation. You'll go to the Buddha realms and you'll, you know, whatever. And if you disobey my laws and don't do the right thing, then you will be, you know, reincarnated as a lower being. And, you know, it, it, it's all the horrible memes of, 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 of those ideas, which thrive on our our natural human tendency to believe in a permanent self inside and that's why meditation and the, the the that path is hard because letting go of that is not you know it, it, it's tough it's such a it's such a strong um well i think it's a bunch of memes but it's it's a, such a strong um story that brains tell themselves for good reasons to you know well, what so about live, live Ian? Ian Stevenson's thousands of accounts of children with past life memories that checked out. I was in this village in India and my people were shoemakers and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Where do you yeah. think that comes from? Uh, it is very interesting. I don't know. I, I have to, no, you're taking me back. The thing is, when you talk about near death experiences, I've kept up with uh, modern research on that. When we talk about classical parapsychology, I would consider myself an expert in it um, as much as one can be up to about the end of the last century. Um, and then I really stopped doing parapsychology. And, you know, I it really is hard when there's a claim made of some paranormal claim to do the investigation. And I've done quite a lot. And, it you know, it's hard work. And I'll only do it if I think it, it, it it's a feasible and, and I have the money or whatever time to do it, you know. And I think it's really important. Now, I couldn't go out to India and check any of these things myself, so I don't have first-hand um, knowledge of it. But I would say that um, Stevenson himself didn't speak any of the Indian languages that people were speaking, Urdu, Hindi, whatever, in the places he went to. He relied on local um, translators. Now, can you imagine, in the period when he was working, 
um, 60s, early 70s, I guess, um, what it was like in an Indian village when somebody comes along in a car, villages where perhaps they've never seen such a thing, where that your story is going to be told and someone puts a tape recorder in front of you, in those days probably an actual tape, you know, and, and, and listens to you, the incentive to tell wonderful, convincing stories. And little kids are so brilliant at telling stories. And they'll pick up from, I mean, I'm assuming in these villages, these kids would probably not have a library full of books um, or a television, but they would have lots and lots of stories. And there would be people coming and going from other villages and there would be stories about people in other villages. I, I, I can't give you a definitive answer about it, but those are the kinds of things that I would take as a starting point to, to investigate and find out. Mm. You see, here's something I really want to say and, and perhaps should have said earlier. If any of these things are true, wow, you know, everything we know about the world is wrong. Well, not everything's wrong, but everything is kind of wrong. We need to rethink everything. It would totally transform certainly our understanding of, of, of the brain and the mind and the human body, but also the understanding of, of, of the physical world. It's really important if it's true. <laughs> People blithely go, oh, yeah, I believe in it. Well, like, yeah, you can believe in it all you like, but if it's true, Think of the consequences and let's investigate them. That's what kept me going for such a long time of really slogging away and endlessly find, oh, maybe this works. And, oh, no, that one doesn't work. Oh, maybe this does. I'll just try one more. You know, that because it would be important if true. Yes. How does your work with memes fit in at evolutionary memes? It's almost like they're similar to DNA. Could you explain what your concept is of, the, of memes? Yes. Yes, it, it, I'm not sure that it terribly does fit in, but of course I just mentioned it, so I didn't know what to explain. Um, the concept of meme was, um, the term was invented by Richard Dawkins in his very famous book, The Selfish Gene. And the purpose of that book was to show um, that in, in biology, it's really the competition between genes to get copied and passed into the next generation. This is this is Darwinian evolution. You, 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 the evolutionary algorithm is something, I take anything you like, Take, you know, this if you like, copy it 10 times with slight variations, kill nine of them off and only copy one of them and do the same thing again. Keep on copying, varying, selecting. Design just appears out of nowhere. Um, not out of nowhere, but it appears to be out of nowhere. This is how we humans evolved and how every other animal and plant and everything evolved. Now, the point he was making in that book is this is not this, this algorithm, this way of thinking, is not peculiar to genes. It would apply to any kind of information that's copied with variation and selection. So he said, oh, look around us in the, the, the primeval soup of culture. Here are some glasses and ooh, some more glasses and some pens and, a, um, and a, um, you know, a keyboard and a cup and you know, all of these things. The, how do these get here? Ah, they're all another replicator, not genes, not DNA but information copied with variation and selection. So the reason that I have these glasses is because they have passed the selection test again and again and again and ended up in the shops that I happen to be in. And, you know, it's the same selective process. So a meme is any information that is copied from person to person. And you can see this in the operation of internet memes. You can see what happens. Millions, probably billions of pictures of cats and you know whatever and little videos and things are uploaded every day more and more every day how many of them get watched a million times tiny tiny few and to take the cat memes well everyone tries their own variation on the funny one and most of those variants nobody bothers with and one or two get through so that's the basic idea of memes now taken to what i was talking about earlier i think the self is encouraged by all the memes that you know, if I think I believe this and I think that and I own this and I am this and I live here, these words about myself all contribute to building up the, the idea that this self is a permanent thing that has, owns its house and is inside its body. And in that way, I think the memes are part of what makes the illusion of self. So that's how I came to be mentioning memes in this context. So religious memes are God, Creator, yeah, patriarchy. Virgin, virgin birth, um, virgin birth. Uh, the, um, the the stories in the Quran and the Bible and the Talmud and all of these these things. They are ideas passed on 
from person to person. Um, and the ones that thrive, I mean, I mentioned earlier, one of the, the things that's, that thrive is, is the power of men over women. I mean, men are kind of stronger than women on average anyway. And if they can get a good meme that says that they're, they're more important. And if you think about the biology of, um, of, of veils and, and all of that, you know, the, the biology of, of, of sex differences is, is that for a man to pass on his genes, he should just fuck as many people as possible and let them look after the babies. Um, and for a woman, well, you can only have so many babies and look after them. You need to actually choose which man and you need to try and get a man who will stay around and look after them. Now, you can see that the whole thing of chastity belts and, 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 and burkas and everything um, is uh, enables that basic genetic um, mechanism for for men to make to to maintain sexual control over women, and you know telling them that that you know you're a slut if you show your hair and those kinds of things. So, so those memes are the the most vile part of of many religions. I think it's really sad that we, um, at least in this country and perhaps even worse in the states, kind of think that. People who believe this stuff are good because religions are good. I call this the altruism trick. It's another meme trick of religions to say, well, if you believe this, you're a good person. And well, the unbelievers they, just, they say it's cultural relativity and we have to be understanding of different cultures. So it's okay to mutilate little baby girls. Yeah, and boys. Um, although less, but yeah. Um, yes, indeed, there's that whole mechanism as well. All of these things, I think, can be helped in understanding them by looking at it from a mimetic perspective. Um, but all of those things, they they rest on the biological basis. And in a way, in a culture, we should be going beyond that. I think it's fantastic that we've gone away from the biology and having gay marriage and those sorts of things um, in some countries, at least, while still in others, um, there's all this oppression. And that idea of cultural relativity and that any any culture is as good as any other. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't I don't buy it. It's not that I have a a deep understanding of right and wrong or what is good and bad. That's really hard philosophical difficulties. But when it comes to something like the FGM that you mentioned, I don't think it's very difficult at all. That is, that is pain for a lifetime and that is abuse. And that's not hard to say, get rid of this, please. But that, but female genital mutilation is an example of a religious meme. Yes, absolutely. We have to make girls that, clean. It appears, though, I believe that there's historical evidence, I'm no expert on this, that it predates um, um, Islam. It's not a, yeah. a, um, that it's a cultural thing to begin with, but then cultural things can be taken over by a religion yeah. um, used to, to further the power. And, of course, that gives, I mean, it's, it gives, gives men power over women. Absolutely. Even though it's the women who actually do it, but the cultural practice um, has that result. Absolutely. Women are become sex slaves, basically. Um, and not allowed to have pleasurable sex either. <laughs> and it still happens in, in countries like the U.S. I mean, thousands of girls are being mutilated. So it's not just like a Middle Eastern African phenomenon. Well, that's where it came from. It didn't start in the States and it didn't start here. But yeah, we have the same problem here. Yeah. Um, what what about consciousness? I mean, everyone talks about the hard problem of consciousness, and you've written books about it and taught courses on it. <laughs> what is lots of <laughs> lots of books and lots of courses and lots of lectures. But I'm afraid to say I, I did explain that I have chronic fatigue from overwork, and I have now been talking to you for more than an hour, which has been great, and I'm really enjoyed it. But I'm going to have to stop because I mustn't make myself more ill. If you'd like to carry on another day, I'm very happy to do that. I'm going right. to...